So multi-celled organisms, we just took a look at how it may have been possible for multi-celled organisms to come about, the idea of environmental pressure and perhaps having a selective advantage, then you can have a multi-celled thing. So let's take a look at multi-celled life. We know it arose about one billion years ago. What, what advantages are there for multi-celled organisms? Well, there are two things really. One, we can now dedicate specialized function to different parts of the body. For example, we can have cells specialized just for sight. We can have cells or groups of cells specialized in function just for locomotion. So being single-celled, you can't do this at all. But being multi-celled, now we can have specialization and this then creates an organism that is much more efficient. So it's huge in terms of efficiency. The second idea is that a multi-cell organism can be really big. I mean, really, really big. They can span an enormous range of sizes. For example, what's the biggest multi-cell organism on the earth? Good guess, but no, it's not a whale. Here is the biggest multi-cell organism on the whole earth. It happens to be a fungus. This fungus grows in Oregon. It's one fungus and it spans an area of three square miles. A fungus, that's it, three square miles. Let me show you what that looks like. Let me give you an idea how big that is. Take a look at this. Hopefully you can recognize where we are. We're right here inside this building. Let's move out. Okay, so here's our little high school. I'm gonna move down a little bit. And so this red line right here, follow this red line. This is gonna represent, once again, this idea of three square miles. There we go. So this area right here is three square miles. That's how big this fungus is. That is one humongous fungus. <laughs> anyway, moving on. That's, that's pretty big. So one great advantage to being large is that you don't get eaten. That's, that's a pretty good advantage because then you don't die. Dying's bad. What about single cell organisms? How come, if it's such an advantage to be big, why don't we see a, a large single cell? Why don't we see a giant amoeba just rolling down the streets of Irvine? Let's take a look at why. What we see in this picture is diffusion in small and large cells. So what's happening here is I have a large cell here and a small cell there. You can tell by the words, large cell and small cell. But what we're trying to do, if I have a cell, in order to live, I must get nutrients to the inside of this cell. So in a large cell, the nutrients have to travel a much further distance to get to the middle of the cell, while in a small cell, the nutrients travel a much shorter distance. And what kind of nutrients are we talking about here? Obviously, those nutrients we're going to use to do cell respiration. I know all of you can write that equation now as we speak. Of course, food and oxygen are important for cell respiration. Those are the kinds of nutrients we need. So as the cell size increases, so does the volume. So it's really a surface area to volume ratio that we're looking at. And when we get back to class, next time we meet, we'll go into more detail on the surface area to volume ratio. Well, are there any advantages to being single-celled? Sounds like multi-celled the way to go. Well, let's take a look at this next graphic and you tell me. Obviously, there is a huge advantage to being single-celled. In fact, if we look at the biomass on the Earth, most of our biomass is in fact single cell. Our bacteria, archaea, meaning algae, some fungi, protists, even some animals are single cell. So there is an advantage. What is that advantage to being single cell? There are basically three advantages to being single cell. One, they can reproduce much, much faster. Easier to reproduce if you're single cell. Not much to do, really, really simple. We just split. We'll go over that in more detail later on. Second, being single-celled requires a lot less resources. It requires a lot less DNA. Three, it's much, much easier to get rid of wastes if you're single-celled. 
contrary to popular belief, poop does not just happen. If you're multi-celled, it's a long, involved process. If you're single-celled, eh, it's pretty easy. Get rid of waste like that, pretty simple. What we see here is green algae. Now green algae, it's green so it does photosynthesis, but we see a clustering of cells. And just like in the chlorella we looked at previously, this clustering of cells make it, makes it bigger and therefore less likely to be eaten. But this volvox is a colony of cells clustering together, cooperating together. It's not multi-cell. There is no specialization of the cells at all. It's clustering together, just like the chlorella, but it's also doing something else. You can't see it here, but what we have is a bunch of cells off the edge here that act like a flagella. That's just a whip-like tail. It moves back and forth to get this thing moving in one direction. What direction do they want to move? Well, they're doing photosynthesis, so they want to move towards the sunlight. But here's a more advanced feature of the Volvox. It has a tail here that is going to move it in one direction. These cells, though, still are not specialized. So by definition, this is not a multi-celled organism. There is no specialization. It's just more complicated than what we had before. In fact, there's one more thing here. You can see these dark bodies here. The Volvox has dedicated parts of its mass to reproduction. So we see then Volvox as a colony being more and more like a multi-celled thing, but still not multi-celled because it doesn't have specialization of the cells. All of these cells are the same. So levels of organization, we can have different levels of organization in specialized cells, in multi-celled organisms. As we look here, here's a cell that is specialized. So we've got some organization here. We have the organelles. Each organelle has a particular function. The function of this particular organelle, this is the chloroplast. This is where we have the chlorophyll, which takes in the sunlight so that this plant can do photosynthesis. So if I have a number of these specialized cells that all work together, we call this a tissue. So specialized cells, the same specialized cells working together is a tissue. If I have a number of tissues working together, now we're looking at the organization of an organ. So different tissues working together for the same function create an organ. So here I have a number of tissues. Here's my organ, the leaf. In the leaf, I have tissues that collect sunlight. And you have these veins here, the ribs. These are tissues that are going to carry nutrients back and forth to and fro the leaf itself. I then collect up a number of organs and I have a complete organism. So I have leaves here and I have the flowering part here. Each of these is an organ. They all work together for the organism. We know what the leaves do and hopefully all of you know what the flower is for on a plant. No, it's not to look pretty, it's not to smell nice, it is for reproduction. In the human body, we have a number of specialized cells. We have red blood cells here. One drop of blood is gonna contain about a trillion red blood cells. Each of these red blood cells functions just to carry oxygen. So it's a very specialized cell, that's all it does. Muscle cells, they function just to cause motion. And then we have nerve cells, they function just to transmit messages. So our human body has very specialized cells. So we go back to our tree of life. Remember the tree of life has our three domains, archaea, eukarya, and bacteria. As we look at the tree of life, the question comes up, did multicellularity happen only once? Did it evolve just one time in, throughout the history of life on the earth? And the answer to that, of course, is no. Multicellularity evolved many times. As we look at our tree of life, we recognize that fungi, there are single-celled fungi, and then we have multi-celled fungi. Plants, same thing. We have single-celled plants, which become then multi-celled plants. Same thing with animals. So we see this happening on three different branches in our tree of life. So we know multicellularity happened a number of different times because it is such an advantageous trait.